We must now move on to questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And I call Ms Megan Fairn. Uh, question one. Uh, <clears throat> my department invests approximately £30 million each year in supporting the training of undergraduate nurses, midwives and doctors at our local universities. Beyond graduation, my department invests significant expenditure in ensuring health professional, that health professionals continue to receive the highest quality training and can therefore achieve the rewarding careers within the HSC. The attractiveness in what we, of what we offer is reflected in the comparatively high rates of retention of health professional graduates within the system here. The foundation programme for doctors is highly regarded, with 80% of training places being filled by graduates from um, Queen's University uh, Belfast Medical School. This is a much higher percentage of local medical school graduates than any other region in the United Kingdom. Similarly, we have a good record in retaining nurses locally after graduation. For example, in 2011-12, 79% of graduates from the School of Nursing and Midwifery at QUB were employed within Northern Ireland. However, we are not complacent and are working on a number of strategies to encourage nursing graduates to remain here. We invest nearly £8 million per year in supporting the post-registration training of nurses. My department is also currently scoping the cost of developing a graduate nurse programme for newly qualified nurses and has commissioned the Northern Ireland Practice Education Council for Nursing and Midwifery to develop career pathways to support all newly qualified nurses. I would also observe that the HSC is a good employer, providing flexible conditions of service, including part-time working, term working, etc., that are attractive to graduates. It is inevitable that highly qualified and motivated health professionals which we produce are well regarded by other English-speaking health systems across the world. However, we have considerable success when compared to other parts of the UK in retaining our health professionals after qualification. For supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask how the Minister intends to encourage new graduates into specific fields um, that we require most for our local health service? Well, in terms of nursing, for example, um, I have Given the task of education and training of nurses, uh, the responsibility of that to the chief nursing officer. So you will have a much greater nurse-led focus applied to the further training and skills of our nurses. And I think that, that is wholly appropriate uh, because we look at the, the, the various strands of nursing, the specialisms uh, that can be developed, the, the further upskilling of nurses who are doing so much more than they would have been. Uh, 10 years or 20 years ago, and there are still many opportunities there, uh, and, and that is a course of work that she will be engaged in. I call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Dr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answers um, to the questions so far. Um, can the Minister provide a breakdown of how much he is investing in the training of nurses? We invest around uh, £30 million in total uh, on training of, of doctors and, and nurses and indeed um, other healthcare workers. In terms of uh, the nursing provision, uh, it is an important um, component and element of it. And the department provides support by way of payment of university fees uh, to students taking up commissioned places. For the year 2013-14, that totaled some £14,629,000. In addition, £12,703,000 was paid by the Department to provide non-loan financial support in form of bursaries to nursing and midwifery students at local universities. The Department also supported the post-registration training costs of nurses by £7,766,972. Uh, so it is fairly evident that we are very supportive um, of nurses uh, in general, and that's something uh, that we will continue to do. Uh, I recently uh, have given uh, greater support to the training of health visitors. So in 2011-12, uh, there was 18 health visitors trained, moving up to 25 in 2012-13 and 37 in 2013-14. I have, however, approved the commissioning of 61 health visitors 
for the year 2014-15 to ensure that there will be sufficient numbers of health visitors trained to meet the needs of the population. Uh, and I think that that is a very significant commitment given the financial pressures that we are under at this time. Uh, but I do believe in transforming your care, and a key element of transforming your care is early interventions. Health visitors are an important and essential and critical component of those early interventions. The work that we are doing in family nurse partnerships, all of that, there, our health visitors are vital uh, to such services, and that's why I'm investing in them. Well, Mr. Colm Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, for his answers thus far. Uh, can I ask him what assessment is being made of the bank system to ensure that those people who are qualified get uh, full-time and permanent jobs? Well, in, in terms of bank nursing, given the nature of nursing, bank, bank has been used for many years uh, and has been used successfully for many years. However, uh, in terms of uh, capability studies, uh, it is important that we have the adequate number of nurses in the first place and bank supplements whenever at weekends someone uh, isn't available or someone takes ill or holiday pay or, or ho holidays or whatever. It is merely something to supplement your core workforce. Uh, I raised the issue of normative nursing uh, whenever we were discussing the gap in the budget. And normative nursing is something which we are working towards and keen to, 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 to con bring to conclusion. And that was under threat, and I suppose remains under threat uh, until the October monitoring round it actually happens and, and we see where we stand. Uh, but we are committed uh, to ensuring that we can have what is nor described as normative nursing, which is approximately 1.3 nurses per patient. Will members please note that question 11 was withdrawn. I now call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Uh, question number two, Kesh Devereda. I cannot be precise about when a decision will be taken on the location of this facility. The HSCB report on the issue, which I received in May, was inconclusive. I have now asked the Western Trust to develop a full business case to assist in determining the need for and location of this facility. This will take account of financial and value for money considerations together with the board report findings. After that, timing of the project will be subject to budgetary availability and this project will be needed to be considered alongside all other demands on the capital budget as we move to the next budgetary period commencing in 2015-16. Well, Mr. Michael Duff for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware of uh, my long standing interest in this issue. But can I ask Minister Poots if his recent welcome decision to develop and enhance the addictions treatment unit in OMA, together with the commencement of the building of the new hospital in OMA, provides compelling arguments for the retention and development of acute mental health services in OMA, where they have been professionally delivered for over 100 years? Well, it's definitely a good try by the member uh, to make the case, but nonetheless, uh, we will await the report that comes from the Western Trust and the recommendations uh, that they arrive at. There, there is strong and cogent arguments being made, uh, both for OMA and indeed uh, for a facility beside South West. And uh, I'm not in a position to, to, to make a final decision at, at this point, but I'm certainly in a position to listen to all of the arguments. Um, that are being put forward and give uh, consideration uh, to this important issue, which I know is important at a constituency level. It's also uh, important at a health level, and that has to be where, where we place our priority. Call Mr. Joe Byrne. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers and welcome the fact that he has progressed the local enhanced hospital no more. Can I ask the Minister, would serious consideration be given to the capacity and expertise that has been built up in the past in the OMA area in relation to mental health, and that would be part of the consideration before a final decision is made? Uh, it certainly will be part of the consideration that there is a degree of expertise that exists in that area um, that has provided um, care for people uh, in, uh, you know, in the past and, and currently. <clears throat> the problem that OMA has in terms of the, the argument that it makes is that every other mental health facility will be beside an acute hospital. So had the decision been taken in, uh, uh, whenever 
that we had the previous uh, administration uh, that the hospital would have been in, in Oma as opposed to the acute hospital in Oma as opposed to the South West, then it would be uh, an easier decision to make on Oma. Uh, so it is a complex uh, set of issues that we have to, to, to go through here uh, before we make a final decision, but we will give in, uh, everything due and fair consideration. Well, Mr. Michael Majumpsey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. In the absence of additional funding being provided for health and social care, it is now necessary to consider the implementation of a range of measures designed to address my department's current funding gap. One of these is pay restraint. I have asked the Northern Ireland Executive to consider these measures and their potential impact on the citizens of Northern Ireland. The decision on pay will be taken, fo will be taken forward following this consideration. Mr. Majimsey for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Bearing in mind that the stress many staff are feeling in attempting to deliver the service for patients, and bearing in mind that one of the key ingredients is having the right number of people in the right place at the right time with the appropriate skills necessary to address the needs of patients, uh, is it wise to allow a situation uh, to develop that may cause staff to consider industrial action concerning the proposed 1% pay rise? which is, let's face it, a very small amount. Uh, yeah, well, the situation is, 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 is simple. I, I, I would want to give them more than 1%. I would want to give them uh, the 1% plus, plus a, a, incremental pay rise. Uh, that isn't what has happened in England, where it's 1% or incremental. And uh, I've raised this issue at the executive twice. So at this moment in time, my budget falls £140 million short. If I was to uh, introduce pay restraint, which means staff will get uh, 1% or staff will get their incremental pay rise, but not both, that will save £14.9 million. So whilst that gap of £140 million remains unmet, that certainly is an area which will be given consideration to. Uh, so it is really a matter for the executive to decide um, in the October monitoring round how much money I receive. I would hope that that October monitoring round will come forward sooner rather than later because I don't think it is good for staff morale um, on any of these issues uh, to have uncertainty. And at least if we have some certainty, people know what the situation is. So I am not holding back on giving a pay rise. There will be a pay rise of some description. Uh, whether that involves pay restraint or not depends on the envelope that is delivered to me by my executive colleagues. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his answers today? Does the Minister recognise public concern about bonuses? Bonuses which are better probably known as Clinical Excellence Award, awards paid to consultants. And has he any uh, plans to review them? Yeah, on that issue, um, well, we, we froze uh, clinical excellence awards over the last two years, and in actual fact, um, we're paying out less now for clinical excellence awards than was previously the case. Uh, I recognise public concern on this issue, and it is a difficult one. First of all, these are now recognised as part of people's contracts, so taking clinical excellence awards away from people who have them uh, will almost certainly. Uh, leave us in the courts with a very weak base uh, to make our case. The second element of it is that in many of our hospitals we are hearing a message that it's difficult to get consultants, difficult to retain consultants. And that is particularly evident in the west of the province, indeed in hospitals like Causeway and so forth. So, you know, we have people on the one, one side arguing, well, you shouldn't be given. Um, the, the, these consultants' bonuses, and on the other hand, they're arguing, but we want all of the services, and those services can only be provided by having the consultants available to do the job. So sometimes people are asking for, very often, in fact, they're asking for what is impossible. You want to get the consultants there, on occasions you're going to have to pay them to be there. And we are competing in a global market for, for consultants. They are very skilled people, very sought after people on a worldwide basis. And we have many, many consultants here in Northern Ireland who, who could get jobs anywhere, anywhere in the world 
high demand uh, for people of those skills and capabilities. And maybe sometimes we would do well to appreciate just what we have in terms of the work that is provided, the skills that, that, that are provided uh, uh, through, through our consultants. Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And can the Minister reassure the House, and I think we all understand that there are pressures in the system, can he reassure the House that he's taking all measures possible to deal with admitted, admitted waste in the health service? Well, you see, I would never be one that would try to claim ridiculous things like there's no waste in the health service. Can we pinpoint every pound of waste? Uh, no, we can't. Can we reduce waste? Yes, we can. Have we reduced waste? Yes, we can. Uh, and, and, and all of those things are important. So, you know, we have saved £492 million over the course of the last three years. We're saving a further £170 million this year. And if I'm asked to live with something less than £140 million, that will be on top of the £170 million. So we're heading close to actually saving three quarters of a billion pounds over the course of the four years, whilst at the same time bringing down waiting times and waiting lists and increasing the number of nurses and doctors, uh, consultants, allied health professionals. So yes, I want to continue to drive out waste because if I can get rid of waste, that allows me to employ more people um, who are actually doing frontline uh, service jobs. And the more I can employ people to do frontline service jobs, will ensure that we get a better health service for the people that we all want. Call Ms. Bronwyn McGatton for a question. Gourmet, I'll get a question for. The reason the Workforce Planning Group was established to take forward the specific proposals within the Transforming Your Care relating to workforce planning. The group is currently completing the development of a framework for workforce planning, which will strengthen HSC workforce planning across the region and inform the basis for taking forward a programme of workforce reviews. Whilst the framework is being finalised, my department continues to lead on regional workforce planning, and a number of workforce reviews are currently in progress in relation to nursing, medical specialists and medicine. In addition, workforce planning is an essential element of several other reviews going forward, such as the review of imaging services. These reviews will provide important evidence to help influence education, commissioning decisions. My vision for HSC workforce planning is to move towards a more integrated, flexible and responsive system that identifies the workforce numbers, skills, values and behaviours that patients and their families need both today and into the future. Ms McGahan for supplementary. Gourmet, I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, a, a number of pieces of consultancy work um, into, conducted into workforce planning over the years. Can you tell me uh, how much has this cost? Well, the member hasn't been specific, so it would be impossible to, to, to answer that question. Um, I know that we are currently spending um, around a million pounds on the TYC consultation uh, support that has been provided. Uh, the, 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 the level um, of skills uh, relating to very specific issues wasn't available either within the HSCB, or the Department or the Trust, and that's why that um, support has been provided. And uh, it has been provided uh, in the belief that we will actually save money um, and save more than the million pound that is spent as a result of the work that is carried out on our behalf. And Mr. Gregory Campbell. Deputy Speaker, uh, can the Minister outline the impact that he's had on the numbers of key staff in the local health service workforce? Well, in terms of, uh, of, of where we are in, in, in administration and uh, clerical, if we look at, at the, the, the periods of time that, that between March 2011 and 2014, um, that's, that has now changed and, 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 and moved, moved on um, somewhat significantly um, towards downwards. But in terms of qualified nurses and midwives, uh, we have had a 5.7% increase. In terms of nurse and midwifery support, we've had a 3.1% increase. In terms of consultants, we've had a 15% increase. In terms of allied health professionals, we've had a 12.7% increase. And in terms of allied health profession support, We've had 21.7% uh, of an increase. 
The whole time um, equivalent number of nurses um, has moved up uh, well and that is something that we will continue uh, to seek uh, to ensure that, that is the case. On, on the other side, uh, we would look at administration and clerical having went down from 12,693 to 11,054, the state services dropping from 697 uh, to 694. Uh, support services 6532 down to 4840. So there's a series of things that, that we have made changes in and that I think is, is, is uh, to the good. Call Mr Sean Rogers for a question. Happy Speaker. Minister number five. My commitment and my department's commitment and the commitment of all those working in health and social care is to provide health high quality services that are safe, effective and person centred. To achieve this, my department uh, develops priorities and objectives and sets standards for the provision of health and social care in Northern Ireland. We set targets to monitor performance, we listen to the experience of clients, patients and their families, and we ensure that professionals and services are appropriately regulated. The department's statutory duty in relation to health and social care is set out in Section 2 of the Health and Social Care Reform Act 2009. The Act places a duty in the department to promote an integrated system of health care designed to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of people in Northern Ireland and in the prevention and diagnosis and treatment of illness and social care designed to secure improvement in the social well-being of people in Northern Ireland. The department itself does not provide services directly to the public. A total of 17 arm's length bodies providers contribute to the provision of health, social care and public safety services. In addition to its responsibilities for setting the policy and legal framework for these services, my department is responsible for holding these bodies to account for the manner in which they govern themselves and the, the extent to which they deliver on my priorities. My department issues an annual commissioning plan direction to the HSC board and the public health agency. The direction details my priorities and sets standards and targets to be achieved in any given year. In responding to the direction, the HSC board, in consultation with the PHA, produces an annual commissioning plan what sets out the services to be commissioned. Mr Rogers, for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? I speak of a courageous young lady in South Down that you know of as well as I do, has spinal muscular atrophy, who needs an uninterrupted un supply of electricity in order to live. What can you do as Minister in terms of provision of a generator to ensure she re receives the same level of care as the rest of us would have? Well, first of all, I know the young lady uh, very well, and, and, and she is indeed a very brave young person who has done much uh, in, in terms of raising awareness about the particular condition from which she suffers, and uh, is a great encouragement to us all in her fortitude and in, 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 in how she manages uh, that particular condition. Uh, I know that this matter has been dealt with quite extensively by the trust that, that provides a service for her. And I understand that she has particular concerns and worries about uh, the circumstances should there be a long-term power failure. And I know that the sort of um, backup that there is in terms of, of the battery provision um, should electricity stop. And indeed, uh, the, the, what has been put in place for, for transfer uh, to Thompson House, sh should that be required uh, in a very, very uh, long-term electricity cutoff. So I understand that she has particular concerns and she hasn't been fully reassured by the Trust as yet. Um, and I think that it's a matter for the Trust and indeed uh, the, 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 the constituent of Mr Rogers uh, to try to work this, this out. I thank the Minister for his question, but can I ask specifically in relation to the Department's duty of care for the Minister to give an assessment to both the staff and the patients in the Royal Hospital on trolley waits last evening? Well, I happen to know a fair bit about what happened uh, in the Royal yesterday because um, actually a relative of mine went through the emergency department. Uh, they, they went in at half eleven and were admitted to the ward before three o'clock. And uh, sometimes what you hear in the media and press uh, doesn't accurately reflect uh, what goes on. So there was certainly a considerable pressure on the Royal uh, yesterday. 312 patients attended. It remained constant throughout the day. 
Um, on average, the Royal sees 256 patients. So there was a considerable spike of close to 20% yesterday, and the consequence of that uh, was that it was a very pressurised place. Emergency departments are pressurised places, and that is the nature of it. Uh, we're doing considerable work, and I trust that uh, Ms. McLaughlin, while she didn't support me at the committee to get more money, uh, I trust that her executive colleagues in Sinn Féin will be more supportive than her, uh, because one of the things, or a number of the things that we were looking for, was uh, money for dormicillary care to ensure that we could ins people can be discharged reasonably. Uh, money for the social work teams that carry out the discharge, money for radiology so that people will have the proper imaging at the hospital door, additional money uh, to ensure that we can continue uh, to invest in emergency departments, and money for normative nursing. Now, if Sinn Féin doesn't think that that's money that's well spent, that's a matter for Sinn Féin to to the public. I think that we can really improve our flows in hospitals and ensure that our emergency departments can operate more efficiently. Did we, uh, were we to get that support. And I would hope, because it was suggested that the October monitoring round could actually be uh, completed for the end of September, I would hope that that's the case. I would hope that Sinn Féin won't uh, cause there to be any delays on the October monitoring round to come forward earlier rather than later, because it will help us actually make these very important decisions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, earlier. And that would be to the benefit of the community. Call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Sure, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. But does the Minister believe that his department is showing the duty of care to all those who walk through the doors of Antrim's A&E? Because the provisional figures for last month, which is meant to be the quietest time of year, showed that only 65% were treated within four hours, even though the target is 95%. Well, I suppose, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I hadn't been left to the circumstances of the member's uh, own party closing the Mid-Ulster Hospital and the White Abbey Hospital at the same time and sending all of those people to Antrim ED, uh, there might be less pressure on Antrim ED. But that was a decision that his party made, that his party supported, and that the rest of us have to live with now. So that's the consequences that we have to work on. Subsequent to that, we have made significant investment in Antrim ED. We've built a new emergency department which is capable of uh, dealing with 90,000 patients per year. We uh, took on 40 more full-time nurses. Uh, they have uh, a considerable number of consultants available to them. So yes, we are doing our best to ensure that the emergency department in the Antrim area hospital uh, is uh, capable of dealing with the numbers that come through it not least because of decisions made uh, by the members' own party. Call Mr. Cackleboylan for a question. Let a hold. Question number six, please. A, price, a pharmaceutical price regulation scheme has been in place for over 50 years. The latest PPR statements started on the 1st of January 2014, and a payment of £2.89 million in respect of the first quarter of the scheme. That is for the period 1st of January 2014 to the 31st of March 2014 was received by the Health and Social Care Board in June 2014. The PPRS is a UK-wide scheme. The quarterly payments under the provisions of the scheme by the pharmaceutical industry are received by the Department of Health in London in the first instance and are then allocated to each of the devolved administrations. The apportionments are agreed by the devolved administrations each year. The payment in respect of the period 1 January 2014 to 31st of March 2014 was made under the provisions of the apportionment methodology agreed for the 2013-14 financial year. The methodology for apportioning payments for the 2014-15 year has not yet been finalised. <clears throat> it should be noted that PPRS does not create new funding. Rather, monies will no longer be required to meet an increase in the branded drugs bill and ensure that the existing budgets are not breached. Call Mr. Boylan for supplement. Last hand, Colonel August, go on breakish session. I is up to Ragnar. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But could I ask the Minister, in light of his answer, how does he propose that that allocation should be used and is the best value for money? Colonel Margaret. Well, one thing I noted, uh, and when my predecessor was in place, that people regularly called 
uh, for making savings in moving from branded drugs to uh, generic drugs. And that, my predecessors started to do that. I've done a lot more work on it um, since coming into office. So therefore we are spending um, less money on branded drugs. But people didn't always say that, that always had to be invested back into drugs. There's massive demands out there. So last year, for example, we needed something like six or seven million additional for looked after children, vulnerable children, because of additional numbers coming through. We needed additional money for domiciliary care. So this doesn't go back into some pot which says drugs and nothing else uh, can, can, it can be used for nothing else. It goes back into the health service budget. And the health service budget has many stresses and strains, as everybody in this House should well know, uh, given the conversation that has been had over the course of the last six or eight weeks. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. And we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr Ian McCree. Mr McCree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister, um, in respect of Antrim Area Hospital, appointed a turnaround team um, to deal with the pressures that were faced in um, waiting times and has since appointed Dr Tony Stevens as the new Chief Executive. Has the um, Minister or can the Minister give us a, a, a bit of an outline on what he feels the challenges are for um, the new Chief Executive um, since he's taken up his post? Well, there, there's a number of key challenges in, in the Northern Trust area, and I think that all, all trusts outside of the Belfast Trust um, has particular challenges in actually having the requisite number of consultants available to them, and uh, that is an area where Hopefully, having uh, someone who has st uh, standing, real standing in, in the medical community uh, will be able to attract uh, people to the Antrim Area Hospital. Uh, I see terrific work going on in that hospital, in, in, in the labs, and in, in the cancer units, and so forth. Uh, great services uh, being provided um, throughout the hospital. And it had, for a long time, been the focus of a lot of negative attention relating to ED. And whilst it isn't perfect, uh, it certainly is considerably better than, than it was two or three years ago. That negativity that existed around Antrim uh, Area Hospital has diminished greatly over the course of the last uh, two or three years, and that is something that we need to continue to work uh, with people like Dr. Stevens uh, to ensure is the case. Mr. McCree, for supplementary. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, for his response. Um, Given the pressures that the Minister has outlined in respect of his budget, does he feel that um, the impact of not receiving the $140 million that he believes is required to continue to run the health service um, would have an impact on the, the job that the new Chief Executive has? It, it almost certainly will. The Northern Trust has been a trust which has always had significant difficulties with historic funding. And uh, the trust actually provides for the largest population of any trust. So whilst Belfast is a larger trust and, and um, is, is the centre for uh, a lot of expertise, the Northern Trust actually has a larger population. Uh, so it faces huge challenges, and particularly when you get into areas of how we care for the elderly, uh, vulnerable adults and all of that there. There is massive pressures upon that trust, given the population that it serves and the budget that it has. So applying further pressures, and people all talk about the 140 million, that's the pressure that's unmet. We've already asked for 170 million of savings before that, which the Northern Trust and others um, are actually facilitating for us. So um, I'm encouraged that people want to take on the jobs of chief executives um, of trust because whilst we can all criticise them and you know, they'll not always please us, it is an immensely difficult job to actually have to carry out, uh, particularly whenever we're facing more and more demand and less and less resource. Call Mr Paul Girvin for a question. Thank you very much. I'd ask the Minister could he give us an update on the work of the International Expert Group, group on Paediatric Care? Surgery. 
Well, can I thank the, the member for the question? We uh, actually employed or sought to get specific advice uh, on this issue, and we brought in uh, key people uh, to assist us on that. So we had uh, Professor Meyer come over and led a team um, from Boston, the United States of America, uh, to look into pediatric congenital cardiac care. And that has led to the situation where a report was produced and is now with uh, both our department and indeed the department uh, in uh, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, at this stage, uh, uh, the department in, in the Republic of Ireland aren't ready to, to release the contents of that report, although I hope that that will change over the course of the next month. W what I think is important uh, is that the public are actually aware um, of what the recommendations are uh, at an appropriate time. But there is one particular issue of concern to parents and to the representatives of the parents in the, in the various organisations that provide that support, and that was around um, surgical care being provided in Belfast. And regrettably, the, the conclusion that, that these key experts have came to is that the overall model for delivering both children and adults congenital heart services uh, on the island of Ireland um, wouldn't allow Belfast um, to sustain uh, surgery uh, at that site, uh, which would mean that the, the vast amount of vast majority of surgery would actually be carried out in Dublin. Mr. Gervin, for supplementary. Thank the minister for his answer, but in, in answer, and I'm wondering. Uh, did mention that the report was compiled and ready. When will that be made and published and made, made available uh, for, for everyone to, to, to look through? Uh, on the understanding that I appreciate there seems to be some delay in the Republic of Ireland allowing that to happen at the moment. Well, I think one of the issues is that the Republic of Ireland have to develop more intensive care beds in their children's hospital. Um, they're building a new children's hospital, but the impact of actually transferring all of the surgery to Dublin um, at this moment in time will uh, put you know, considerable pressures upon them. So they have work to do to um, appropriately respond to this. Uh, we are hoping that over the course of the next month uh, that we'll be in a position uh, to make a further announcement on it. This clearly is a report and it has recommendations and it is up to myself uh, and to hear the views um, of the Assembly and others and actually arriving at a decision based on the recommendation. But I think that the standing of the people who carried out the report um, is very important. You have doc Dr. Maher from the Boston College Hospital, Dr. Adrian Moran from the Maine Medical Center, uh, Dr. John Sinclair from, from York Hills Children's Hospital. A nursing expertise was pr provided by Dr. Patricia Hickey, also from Boston's Children's Hospital. Uh, so we brought in people who have got real expertise specific to this particular issue. They have made their recommendations and we will have to give them very serious consideration. Call Mr Peter Weir for a topical question. Thank, thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister what progress is, has been made on the issue of waiting times uh, for specialist drugs for those who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis? I remember doing the door in, in the 2011 election from someone who had been waiting uh, and it had been, been eight months since they were recommended to get the drug for rheumatoid arthritis. They couldn't bear the pain, so after um, two months they started to buy the drug themselves on the basis that they were going to get it after nine months, but they had got warnings that these drugs were going to be delayed even further. I, I'm glad to say that there's been a 65% reduction in the number of patients waiting uh, for specialist drug treatment for arthritis. From 393 in June 2011, to 137 in June 2014. The numbers of patients who were waiting over three months for treatment in June 2011 was 290. That compares to zero today. So that was something which was reflected uh, to ourselves. Uh, I remember Mr. Wells brought uh, the, the rheumato rheumatologist to see us. He brought individuals to see us who, who were suffering. And we made a decision that people wouldn't have to wait for this specialist drug. It is also used for the treatment of psoriasis, and uh, that has uh, changed in terms of the people waiting. Uh, from April 2012, it was 48, 
and that's went down to 18 in June, uh, whilst the number waiting over three months for this treatment fell from 26 in April 2012 uh, to one in June 2014. So considerable progress has been made on what is an expensive drug, uh, but nonetheless one that reflects a dramatic difference to the well-being of individuals who use it. Mr. Weir, for supplement. Uh, thank, the, thank you, Deputy uh, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. It's very good to see uh, the progress that is being made, indeed the, the improvements that are occurring in this field. Can I ask the Minister how difficult it would be to recover any slippage that might occur in the waiting times for these drugs? Well, obviously this involved a, a considerable investment uh, to reduce the waiting times for, for the individuals involved. Um, therefore, if, if it becomes a yearly thing, uh, you're going to have to do a considerable investment again to, re, to, 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 to pull back to the position that we're now in. So I think it's important that we as an Assembly don't allow there, there to be slippage on this particular issue. It should be an issue that's important to us. Very, very clearly people who weren't employable are back into employment on the basis of receiving these drugs and have a normality in their life again, uh, which didn't exist because they were constantly uh, in quite severe pain. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, the framework for consultancy services that was issued earlier on this year, the consultants were informed sort of early June of whether or not they were on the list, and then late June uh, the whole process was, was, was terminated due to a legal challenge. Um, how can you ensure that if, if there's a rerun of the system, um, that those who were successful, who were on the list for the first stage, uh, will, will not be disadvantaged the second time round? And a uh, very good question about sustaining a legal challenge the second time round as well. So uh, that will obviously involve a course of work where we will work as closely with uh, the representative bodies uh, to arrive at a conclusion uh, where we can deliver as, as, as much of what would be acceptable um, to the representative bodies and ensure that um, we can uh, move forward with this in, in a very professional way. Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Bearing in mind the, de the delay for all concerned, I suppose my question really is that the money that was uh, set aside for this improvement across the trust, is this money ring-fenced or is it to be spent during 14-15? Well, uh, it's certainly all of these monies, um, you will identify them at the start of the year for, for a particular service. Uh, if it isn't spent, it will be spent somewhere else because it certainly won't be handed back. Uh, but in the meantime, we will seek to, to find a way forward and agreement on this, uh, which will be in everybody's interest. Mrs. Dolores Kelly for Thank topical you, Deputy question. Speaker. Minister, be aware of the pressures over the last couple of evenings in Belfast uh, uh, hospitals, in particular the Royal Victoria. Uh, Minister, uh, winter pressures will soon be upon us. I don't think it's good enough to uh, hi hide behind that particular excuse. Will you now reconsider uh, the closure of Belfast City Hospital's NE uh, service? Oh, I'm not sure the member wants me to consider the closure of an emergency department that hasn't been open for, for a period of time, but actually what's if the member was following the health brief particularly well, uh, she would have heard that it is our intention uh, to actually open up facilities in Belfast City Hospital, which will ensure that general practitioners are going to be able to directly admit mainly our older people um, who have respiratory um, or renal conditions uh, directly to the city hospital and uh, use uh, facilities there for a medical assessment unit. So many older people won't have to go through an emergency department to be admitted to hospital. They will have all of their tests run in the city hospital and allow admittance, or indeed, uh, if there's a different decision arrived at by the consultants, um, that will be the case. Uh, but that is a plan for this winter, and I'm glad to be able to inform the member of that. Mrs Kelly for supplementary. Uh, I can assure the Minister I do follow the health uh, brief uh, closely and uh, Minister you will know it was about review uh, the decision to close any services which was always I understand the case to be it was to be given a temporary closure at one st stage and I'm sure Deputy Speaker you and others will forgive me in, whenever Ministers use words like shortly and in due course because it seldom happens is it now the case Minister that there is no money for, t uh, for transforming your care and what we're saying that you are now relying on monitoring rounds 
to, to plug the gaps? Well, of course, TYC became after the budget. So it was never part of the original budget. It has always been reliant on monitoring rounds. So uh, I know the member doesn't sit on the committee uh, and maybe doesn't understand the issues as, as well as, as, as she might otherwise, uh, but that has always been the case. So this, that isn't a breaking story today. Uh, we have managed to invest £40 million in TYC. I would like to have invested more at this point, uh, but we are making a dramatic difference. And the member mightn't like to, to hear about it, but in terms of atrial fibrillation, there's a course of work going on in atrial fibrillation, which will ensure that 150 less people in Northern Ireland will suffer from stroke than is currently the case. Now, that will not make news headlines because the fact that you don't have a stroke isn't news. But for 150 people who don't have strokes, that is something which we will take great pride in delivering through transforming your care. That is what we talk about in terms of preventions and early interventions to get better medical outcomes. We have elderly people now who are getting blood transfusions, IV antibiotics in their own homes. We have cancer patients who are getting uh, treatments in their own homes which weren't previously available and that's transforming our care in action and that is where we are progressing to and that is why I'm totally committed to transforming our care whilst members um, on her own benches have been questioning whether we should be doing it for some considerable time. Order. Time is up.